Plastic Nature, a philosophical poem by Terence Craig, Canto 11. Long since the non-unicity of man was known, accepted by the ancient sages. They saw the distribution of life's plan in brain, in heart, in organs, at all stages. Then, reading Descartes' influential pages, men wanted to deposit in the brain all mind which the unthinking body engages. This mental organ yet itself is twain, and the unicity of man is sought in vain. And so the search goes on for a single source, the yearning that man with himself be at one the urge to live life on a single course, which with his parting breath man will have run, his soul at peace when all is said and done. Alas, the human body is manifold, the brain itself is too in nature's son. What's more, his action and his thought all told are both by will and automatic skill controlled. Poetry is a kind of language that relies on the automatic, for its base is sound rather than meaning, and it wastes and dies if used for reasoning. The poet's bound to focus on emotion, not expound ideas, Houseman said. Poetry comes from somewhere else within us, from the ground of what we used to be, which reason numbs, whenever rhyme accords with rhyme and rhythm hums. Cambridge was where the late houseman abode, and so he knew the fens, or what remained of that once wide expanse, where water flowed amid the bogs and reed beds it contained, before desire for farmland had them drained, and turned them into fields to grow rich crops. That new land was the part of man constrained to reason, yet subsists a leafy copse of poetry where all the talk of reason stops. Now, verse is based on rhythm, and so it goes beyond the normal speech of the everyday. Accesses the semiotic, for it knows how to use those resources in the lay, bringing their riches to the light of day. Like music, it incorporates the beat of life itself into the words that weigh, heavy or light, and stepping slower fleet, from organs pulsing as their products they secrete. And as for rhyme, it adds a new dimension to poets' choice of words, for it has naught to do with meaning's linear comprehension, but makes a kind of harmony to thought, or like a solitary voice that's fraught with echoes sounding through an empty hall, although the echoes have no meaning caught. And thus a poem is easy to recall, for what is memory but the echoes that still fall? It is as if in poetry the sound had freed itself from any verbal meaning, so that, although a message there is found, the enjoyment for the ear is always weaning itself away from thought and rather leaning to music, which is sound without a sense, emotion without reason intervening. Yet just as music meaning can dispense, so poets convey with words a meaning more intense. Poems and music both can be hypnotic, for in both the automatic reigns supreme. To work, this must rely on the semiotic, which comes before speech and remains the theme for meaningful distinctions that we deem the soul of language. Poetry, though its sound is made of verbal signs, must always seem to speak, not just to minds that gather round, but to listeners who in the shadows can be found. It speaks not just to normal conscious reason, but to the unconscious thinking far below, which is as ripe and fruitful in its season as any logic that makes thought to grow. 
When mood and feeling seem to be all aglow, thought can rely on sensibility to carry it where logic cannot go and find the fruit that reason cannot see, revealing realms beyond all ideology. And why did poetry develop then? To Cordwell, it began as rhythmic song among the people, ordinary men who cultivated crops, who must wait long to see them grow and flourish, waxing strong, until at last would be their harvest time, such the desire of all the chanting throng. And since the harvest chanting they could mine, to sow seed in advance they made the plan sublime. Now Graves maintained true poetry is a wild speaking in tongues. For long we have forgot what poetry once was. It's now exiled from cultured thinking, and it is its lot to be derided as a Gordian knot, although its origin is in one theme, the story of the lover who is caught in the goddess's web as in a dream, supplanted by a rival in a plot extreme. The great division into consciousness and all the rest of mental life, thought James, was late in history, slow to progress in the organisation of men's thinking brains. Before then, consciousness made little gains. From the right hemisphere there came a voice that ordered man to work and to take pains, the voice of gods that left him little choice but to obey and in obedience to rejoice. We gained our reason in historic times, after the epic of the siege of Troy. Those heroes did not do high deeds and crimes from consciousness, but were of gods the toy. Deciding, they no reason could employ, but just obeyed as gods told them to act. Thus could god pharaohs Egypt's men deploy to build the pyramids, when spoke in fact that voice, no other could them from their task distract. That dread voice of internalised command, emerging from the deep right hemisphere, spoke poetry, unconscious and unplanned, thought Jane's, for whom it was sublimely clear that bright brain transmits rhythm and could steer the work of men who heard the order strong and therefore in their work could persevere, for rhythm is automatic. All day long the verse accompanied the work just like a song. Once consciousness defined the mass of men, the voice of gods was still being heard by some. The oracles of Hellas, and again the prophets of the Bible, who become the mouthpiece of the Almighty. They succumb to inspiration, and their statements sound divine. Yet in time all of them fell dumb. Only the mad by voices now are bound, were it not that too, in hypnotism, such things are found. And yet, too, there are those who speak in tongues, though in this present day and age exiled. It sounds like gibberish, or what belongs to the endless babbling of a two-year's child. But those who make use of this utterance wild mean it as prayer, to express beyond all words what Paul, the Spirit's groans, once strangely styled. Could this be language in fragmented sherds, the semiotic level? like the song of birds? Yes, we still crave divine authorization for deep pronouncements coming from within. And that is why the poet, in his elation, invokes the muse as to God's voice akin, each time he wants his verse work to begin. A shadowy voice is called on to break through the speech of mortals with its dismal din to tell us once for all that which is true, and let us know with certainty what we should do. You have been listening to 
Canto 11 of Plastic Nature, a philosophical poem by Terence Craig. This was the final canto.